people that go to check into a hotel on the end of each separate area of each major city. I told them they could get a credit card for their hotel room. Uh, and so they each uh, pulled out $10 and they each paid $10 for two thirds to their room. Uh, they just took the money, gave their key, they headed to their room. And when they were on their way, the manager realized he'd overcharged them for their room. The charge was only going to be $25. So he pulled five dollars, five more dollars worth, gave it to the hotel, and thought, "Oh well, boy, I got all these uh, hotel rooms only seven dollars, and you guys didn't tell me that." He said, "No, and he said the other guy will too. Stay with me." Uh, so uh, he gives them five dollars, says, "Here, return this to uh, uh, to them and for their room." So the bellboy's on his way, and he realizes, "Well, you can't really divide five dollars up between these people." So he took two dollars, put it in his pocket, and took uh, and donated. Gave one to each of the people, right? So now they originally uh, each paid ten dollars, were given one dollar back, so now they each only paid nine dollars, right? For a total of twenty-seven dollars. The bellboy had two dollars in his pocket, you know, but you add that and he comes up with twenty-nine dollars. What happens to the other dollar? Hmm. Something to think about. Touch me too. Yeah, they put it in the offering plate. <laughs> Twenty-seven plus the two in his pocket is uh, twenty-nine. There's a dollar missing, isn't there? Well, it depends on how you look at it. Some people are pretty good at that. But uh, let me bring up another one here. Uh, it says this: Brothers and sisters, I have none. I don't have any brothers and sisters. But this man's father is my father's son. Who is the man? Brothers and sisters, I have none. This man's father is my father's son. Who is the man? Um, is it true? Do you know it's actually not true? It's not true. Brothers and sisters, I have none, but this man's father is my father's son. What was he trying to say? Actually, the man is the man's son. That man's father is my father's son. But you know, maybe it's just a Person trying to figure out the difference, you got it? Got it figured out? <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> yeah, sure. All right, I'll tell you where the dollar was. It was a total of 27 paid, right? They paid 27 total. Um, the, the, uh, the manager had 25. He subtracted 25 from 27 to get the $2 dollar figure. It's all a matter of how you do your math, but there is a dollar missing in that equation, isn't there? Okay. So it sounds good. It's simple, right? Very simple. And yet, how does it get so confusing? Because that's what happens in life. Sometimes the simplest things can be so confusing. Sometimes decisions in our life can seem like, oh, I should know how to figure this out. But man, life and decisions we make in life can sometimes get very complicated, get very confusing. That's the way life can be sometimes. And it doesn't help that everybody else seems to have a different answer and everybody claims that they're right. The point is this. We face many decisions in our lives. We face many decisions in our families that will be much more difficult to figure out than some of the way that they are. Right? How do you know what to do? How do you know how to make the right decision? It's been said this. Life is the total of all my decisions and their corresponding actions. Life is the total of all my decisions and their corresponding actions. If that's true, then making good decisions is critically important. Wouldn't you agree? In fact, I hope to show today that the decisions that we make on a daily basis are extremely important to the well-being and the direction of our life. Does the Bible have anything to say about the decisions we make? Absolutely. But before I get to that, I want to lay some groundwork. I want to, I want to share with you some, some foundational truths about, about decisions that we make. Here, here's the first one. The first one is this. The most attractive choices can lead to the most unattractive results. The most attractive choices can lead to the most unattractive results. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says this, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to the to destruction and to death. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death and destruction. We face these decisions in life and we think, oh, well, yeah, I know what to do here. I just go with you know, what seems right to me or what feels right, what I feel in my heart or, or go with my gut. And, and, and the, the, the scripture here is saying, well, that's just dangerous because there's a way that seems right to a man. That 
carrying the secret of that very thing is what you need to do to have it so just because something seems good or feels right does not mean it's the best decision in fact I can get to the end and sometimes get it off track we can make bad choices in what we're doing and we do this all the time I mean it goes back really to the original fall of man when he deceived Eve he took that that, that fruit he said God really saved Thank you. 
prayer. Prayer is what, what makes any problem easier to understand because it changes our perspective. Prayer is what puts us in touch with the incredible and awesome power of Almighty God. And prayer is what allows me to hear what God has to say about the situation that he's in. You need to pray. The second thing you need to do if you want to make the decision is you need to decide to pray. You need to decide to pray. Because Proverbs 18 15 says, A heart of the discerning requires knowledge. The ears of the wise. Good decisions that produce good results. We gotta remember that. We gotta learn from that too. So 
so odd that we might make good decisions and, and that we're doing the right things and the good things the way God wants us to and all the things that bring all this good results. And, and, and then time goes along and all of a sudden you find yourself not making those decisions anymore. Ever gone through that in your life? I'll tell you what, I, I, I've done that so many times. Here's what it looks like. Uh, I, I realize, man, I need to just, I need to make some changes on where, where I'm going to make some sacrifices to do what I need to be doing for the Lord every day. I need to get up early. I need to carve out that time. I'm going to make some sacrifices to get some in the Word and, and to really start to pray. And, and then you realize, man, this is awesome. God is doing good. His Word is coming alive. My, 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 my spiritual life is just taking off. I'm just getting all kinds of other good things in my life. And, and I feel like I'm on track and things are great. And, and you're making those good decisions. Somebody says you've abandoned your first love. In other words, their relationship, they, they let it slide and they, 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 they've abandoned that love uh, for God. And, and here's what he tells them. He says, remember the height from which you have fallen. Remember the height. You used to be just soaring for God. Remember the height from which you've fallen. You've abandoned your love and, and, and now you're not at that height anymore. And then he says, repent and do the things you did at first. Go back and start doing those things that you were doing when you were on fire for me. Go back and start doing those things that, that you were doing that were drawing you closer to me and, and, and helping to like keep, keep your life on track and help you do the things that, uh, that God wants you to do. Start doing those things that you did at first. You've got to ask yourself that question. And finally, you've got to ask the right question. You've got to ask the right question. Uh, God, how many decisions did we make this week? without even considering the consequences of those decisions. We probably made several decisions this week where we, we never even asked what, what, what kind of consequences these things are. We just make them. And, 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 and I want to encourage you today to think about asking these two questions for the rest of the year. The first is this. How will it affect God? How will this decision affect God? Is it strictly forbidden in God's Word? Tell you, if God's word has something specific to say about uh, about your choice or about the decision you're making, guess what? Nothing else really needs to be discussed. You don't really need to look any further. You don't need to really think, have to think about it anymore. Because if God's word says you should do this, or God's word says you shouldn't do that, uh, then then it's a done deal. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, it's a done deal. The decision is made. how much you should spend on your car. Or, yes, you should move to a new house. Or, um, you know, should my kids be involved in this activity? It, it may not really spell that out. It is part of school that we should introduce our family. You know, it might not really spell that specifically. The answer to those questions. So you got to dig a little deeper. We begin to ask other questions like, would God be pleased with this decision? Does the decision in any way dishonor God? Maybe ask, what would Jesus do in in this situation? Too many times, though, we we just think, well, it's my life. I can do what I want. Right? Well, I I got news for you. You're going to be a Christian. You're going to be a Christ follower. You've committed to Jesus, and you're going to live your life the way He wants you to live your life, not the way you want to live your life. That's what being a Christ follower means. Is to say, okay, Jesus, I, I committed my life to you. I'm going to be submitting to you, Lord, of your life. This is where the rubber meets the road in living out your faith is to say, I have a decision to make. Jesus, what do you want me to do? Because that's what I choose to do. I agree 
crucified with Christ, he was no longer losing his way. It's Christ who lives in me. It's not your life that you lose. You gave it to the Lord. It's now his. So we can walk in his ways. We trust the Lord with our future and we can do it. We got to the job of the day. It's not your ability to do it. You have to ask, well, how will it affect God? The second question you need to ask is, how will it affect me? How will it affect me? Will it harm my body's health? Will it arouse impure thoughts or desires? Will it create a self-centered attitude in me? Will this thing or this decision or this choice, this activity, will it cause me to be Christ-like? Will it turn me away from God and be the heart of my life? That's how you want to know. A lot of times we get to think things like, well, that's not a sin, so it should be okay. Yeah, but you know what? If it's going to become so important that you need to take it with you to life, if it's going to become sin, you've got to have the focus of your life on the Lord. So how will it affect you? And then finally, you need to ask, how will it affect others? How will it affect others? We'll follow the scripture to ask that question. Well, the same thing for you. How it affects other people. What type of people are most often associated with this, with this kind of decision or this kind of an activity? How will non-Christians look at a person who makes this kind of decision? Will this decision in any way hinder or limit my ability to be a good witness for Jesus Christ? What would my Christian friends think about this decision? Would this decision harm the attitude or the thoughts or the growth of a non or a new believer. And this is where it can get kind of sticky, right? Yeah. Because many times people say, well, if someone has a problem with me doing this, or someone has a problem with this choice, um, that, that's their problem. I have the right to do this. I can do it if I want to. You know what? You're absolutely right. You may have the right. You may have the freedom. You may be able to do that if you want to. But that decision has to be yours. That decision has to stay with you. First Corinthians 10, 23 says this, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Or we might say beneficial. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. And what he's saying in the context of the scripture, if you go back and read it in context, he's saying, yeah, you may have the freedom and the right to do that, but that may not be the best decision. You need to start asking, what's going to be the benefit um, for God's kingdom, for other people, and, 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 and yeah, you might have the freedom, but, but for me, it's not a matter of what's right or wrong. For me, it's a matter of what's good and what's right. And I'll tell you, if you want to make good decisions, don't start out with the right people. Start with your friends. You want to see what the bad guys are doing. Making good decisions, not just for today, but for years ahead. Not just in our own lives, but, but they're, they're important for creating healthy Christ like people. So the decisions we make can be made because of that freedom in our lives. I heard a story of a woman who was driving through the mountains of Western Canada on a dreadful snowstorm. So bad she couldn't really see where she was going. She got lost. And as she kind of looked out her, her window ahead, she could make out that there was this four wheel drive vehicle with a blade on the front and there was some clear snow and so she was like, I'm going to follow that truck. She was trying to open the window but it was just so easy to do so she just got right up behind that truck. She followed it as closely as she possibly could. She was starting to make her way up this road and uh, then as God took time to do that she came down um, and then when God took time to turn around and went up she just kept following this truck and uh, it had been about the third time that they had around and the truck pulls over the man gets out and comes to this woman and says, where are you going? She goes, I'm on my way to Denver. And he says, well, you're never going to get there following me because I'm just out of my driveway. And she goes, oh. What is your roadmap for making good, sound, godly, Christ-like decisions? I, I, I mean, what kind of human heart and hope that it's good? Uh, you know, are you a heart for it? You know, are you just going hard? Are you just... Uh, are, are you just uh, going with your gut? Are you going with your heart? Um, just what seems right to you? Or are you looking around and going, well, everybody seems to be making this decision, so I'll just follow after that? Or maybe you're seeking, you know, going to see a psychic or something. I mean, how do you make decisions? 
Have you ever given much thought to, you know what, I, I need to make sure I, I, I've got the right kind of inflation to get the right kind of decisions. You may realize that the way you're making decisions is that you call one out and you call the other one out. It's not going to really get you to where you want to go as an individual or not even take your family where you want it to go. You get to decide how you make those decisions. Some of our our decisions are just we don't necessarily think it's the Lord for our life. We don't have a lot of decisions that keep us from all that we might be doing for you. But you do in fact help us to do that. And you do in fact help set the direction of our life. So some of those small decisions that lead to other small decisions that lead to other small decisions. Stand. We're going to sing. 